All right. Good afternoon, everyone. This is our Friday career chat. We have Detective Forrest with the Lexington Police Department here. Um, students, if you'd like, you can, you're more than welcome to um, uh, ask questions in the chat. That might be the most effective way to do this. And um, we will get going. All right. Um, welcome, Detective Forrest. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, well, I'll just kind of start off just going to give you an, uh, just kind of a background of myself. Um, well, like, like I said, I'm, I'm Detective Forrest. I'm actually our crime scene investigator for Lexington. Um, I also do evidence and I'm our latent examiner. And I've been doing this for about seven years. And I've actually been in law enforcement for nine years. So during that time, I've kind of been all over the place a little bit, um, but right, I've always had a, a, a big interest in crime scene. So that's kind of one of the things that led me to doing this. Um, it looks like my screen might be frozen. So I have to bear with me on that when I can seem to get it to not do that. But um, yeah, if you can get the screen going, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. Are you from around this area? Where are you from? I'm actually, uh, I was, I grew up in Lexington, so I'm kind of familiar with the area. That's one of the reasons that for me was a kind of a fit for working with Lexington Police Department. Okay. Where did you definitely go? Have, uh, I'm sorry. Well, where, I was going to say, where did you go to school? Uh, I was actually homeschooled. Okay. So um, I was in the North Davidson area, but I was homeschooled. Okay. But it um, growing up in this area did help out as far as being familiar with the area when it came to kind of like knowing where you're at. Because I know a lot of times if you go to somewhere new, as far as like you know your route to home to work, and you don't really know anything else, so that definitely helped out. But um, as far as crime scene goes, typically what I'm my day consists of is either. Uh, examining fingerprints and processing crime scenes. So it can be anything from you have a car break in to something major, like you having some type of shooting or a, a bank robbery or anything of that sort. Um, one of the things with crime scene that comes very helpful is uh, knowledge of forensics. Like I actually went to go for college for uh, forensics. And that's kind of like my background from there. And it uh, helped out as far as processing, like processing techniques. Um, and then once I came here, I started off as a law enforcement officer and I did that for about two years. And then they had an opening for crime scene. So I, I jumped on board with that. And once I got in there, Prior to that, I had no knowledge of fingerprints or latent fingerprints. Um, so once they put me in that position, they actually gave me fingerprints. And from the time I started going, I enjoyed it. I mean, it's, you're looking at a lot of lines and everything like that, but it's very, very meticulous work. But, um, so that's kind of a background of, for me, so does Guilford College, do they still have the forensics program? Yes, they do. Um, I did the night course just because for me, it helped out a lot with um, being able to still work. So I guess it was the uh, continuing ed education aspect of it. It gave me a lot of the training for forensics. When you say forensics, like what... Um, what does what exactly do you study in, in forensics? Forensics is, I feel like forensics is a very broad term for it. the. It can go anywhere from you can have forensic, uh, digital forensics, which is you're basically going into a, a laptop, computer, or cell phone, and looking at the data, or you can go from the aspect I went, which is like biology. So you're dealing with more like DNA. Um, plants and things like that like for example you, we actually i took a uh, botany class which told us we basically learned how plants 
would grow. So if, say you found a body and you had a particular tree uh, root growing around the body, you could determine this tree grows at this rate. So if it's going through the body at this point, then it's kind of gives you an idea of how long the body's been there. Oh, wow. That's interesting. And another part of that is um, like flies. We uh, learned the uh, life, cycle of, life cycle of the bot fly. That way, like, so when you go to a body, you're actually got probably about six different types of insects that go to that body and they go to different sections. So determining what insects are there can kind of tell you how long the body's been there. I had no idea. And of course, and a side note on that one is that's kind of one of my uh, side hobbies is I love entomology. I love anything insects and stuff like that. So it's kind of helped me on that part. That's pretty cool. So this is a heavily science oriented, um, heavily science oriented uh, field. Oh yes, very so. so um, like, okay, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was gonna say uh, another thing we do is, uh, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of the super glue fusion. It's, um, it's actually fun to do like on guns and things like that. You actually will take a, your evidence We've actually got a fish tank that we can use. You basically your, put your evidence in there, you uh, heat the super glue, and it basically fills the tank, and it will adhere to the amino acids of the fingerprint. And that way, you can actually see the fingerprint of something that's dark. Because typically, when we uh, when I process a crime scene, I have uh, basically like the same type of powder that's in your inkjet printer, and that's what I'm doing to process stuff. But if you got a dark surface, such as like a firearm. It's kind of hard to see that without that super glue fusion. I had never heard that. I guess I don't watch enough CSI on TV. <laughs> <laughs> but what was you going to say? Oh, I was. I, well, I was going to talk about um, more like the education, like what you did, liked in school and stuff like that. And, you know, to um, and it did, what it helped you in high school to get ready for this. Well, high school, homeschool. Well, like I said, um, I've always liked kind of science and biology, and that's a big field when it comes to crime scene is you're dealing with a lot of things like that, such as DNA and oddly enough, blood and things like that. Gotcha. I see um, we got a question over here. Yeah. That, yeah. Do you see that? What's the normal career progression from officer to forensic specialty? And how many years? And do you have to be a detective first? That's interesting. I'd like to know That's that. That's a good question. Um, typically, a lot, of course, nowadays, a lot of agencies are going to a civilian aspect. So you basically get your education and then you go towards, uh, for example, um, CCBI, which is the Central Forensics uh, Bureau. That's they basically deal with Wake Forest rock, in that area or Wake Forest County, or Wake County, rather. Um, when you, if you do it as a civilian, you take schooling and then you can go straight to it. Um, me, I did it as a law enforcement officer, mainly because when I, at the time, the, the SBI, uh, they were actually, a lot of their evidence, they're having issues with it, mainly because you had people going straight from forensics and didn't have a much of a knowledge of legal aspects to things so they were getting things con contaminated things like that so I was like I wanted to get a grasp of law enforcement so I kind of had that understanding before just kind of processing evidence um, as far a lot of uh, smaller agencies though what they actually have sworn officers doing crime scene so which is one of the reasons and it also if you're looking to have that law enforcement background, smaller agencies kind of help out for that, for the aspect is if you go to a bigger agency such as, um, i trying to think of one that's got sworn officers. On a thing like Charlotte, Mecklenburg, they've got um, some sworn officers that actually process stuff. But to, in order to get to a forensic specific unit, I mean, it could be anything from several years to probably the majority of your Career, you'd be doing something like patrol work. For me, thankfully, being in a small agency, the opportunity came 
within two years. So it was very beneficial for that aspect. But as far as uh, detective work goes, we actually, our uh, crime scene is tied in with our CID unit, which is the detectives. Um, many places you have crime scene specific and then you have detectives. They work together, but they're uh, two separate unit, units. Whereas we have them, they're kind of like all joined together. So we see we got another question. Oh yes. So let's suppose there was a house break in and the intruder uses gloves to hide his fingerprints. What do detectives do to find the intruder's identity? Well, there's uh, many other ways we can do it. Um, it's not just latents. We also have uh, DNA. Uh, many people have cameras. So we're able to use that. And also um, good old fashioned knocking on doors. Like if we ask, um, it's kind of knowing who's your, uh, who's wandering around around in the area and just any witnesses. So, I mean, there's a lot of times uh, it's looking like fingerprints was at one point was a major thing. Like everybody's like, well, where's the fingerprints? Where's the fingerprints? Now it's, you've got a couple other routes to take, such as just uh, simple things like, you know, when you walk around, you get something in your mouth, you just want to spit it out. If you're at a scene and you do that, that's DNA. Like we actually had one where um, there was a home invasion and the suspects broke into the house and we was actually able to find where they had spat on the carport, collected that and was able to get a uh, identification off of that. So DNA is a big thing now. That's pretty cool. So y'all look, y'all look for everything when you go to a crime scene. Yes. Um, I mean, it's, it's getting now where it's it's constantly improving and especially with DNA. Um, but the the only I'd say the biggest downfall we have is it's it's hard to find if if you've got somebody that's it's new to I guess the criminal lifestyle until they get we get their DNA and fingerprints on file. It's a little tough. It's kind of a uh, almost a cat and cat and mouse game until we can kind of get that once they can do that, it's, they're pretty much stuck. Like a good example was um, a lot of the uh, ancestral type things where you're looking for ancestors and they, uh, they take a sample of DNA to try to look at your chromosomes to see who's, where your uh, heritage is from. They're actually using that DNA as a, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of like a pool, so in a, in a sense, when you uh, submit to one of those, you're actually submitting DNA and they can keep it on file. So down the road, if you're planning on doing, uh, starting a life of crime, I would <laughs> discourage it, especially for that aspect, because people <laughs> will definitely have that on file. That's pretty, well, it's only a matter of time before y'all get it anyway. Yeah, when that's and that's the big thing is it's just, it's the con concept of not being on the system is becoming more and more of a um, anomaly now. You're having more people that just things like that. A lot of things are requiring fingerprints and DNA type aspects. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I've got another question. Do you guys deal with uh, kidnappers? Yes, uh, we actually, we deal with a lot of our um, major crimes such as that. Um, if we have a case where there's a kidnapping, They'll actually assign it to a detective, and we'll we'll work run the leads on that case. Any of any of our uh, major things, such as uh, sex assaults, you know, or assaults in general, robberies, the major stuff, a lot of the stuff you see on news, they'll we'll handle. So you guys handle touch a little bit of everything. That's right. That's correct. Gotcha. So do you stay pretty busy here in Lexington? You'd be surprised how busy Lexington is. I know a lot of people say it's uh, Lexington's a little town, but it's it's a busy town. Gotcha. I mean, we, I'd say uh, there's never a, a dull day. It's always something different, something new, which definitely keeps it interesting. 
Now, um, just so, just to be clear, like what path would you recommend that a student that is going to graduate in the next two or three years and they want to eventually be in your position? Um, what should they do? Uh, go to community college, go to um, go to a four year school. Should they, what should they major in? What what route should do you recommend they take? I would definitely encourage um, if you've got like um, a community college that offers some forensic classes, I would highly encourage that. I'd also um, throw out there, do a ride along. I know um, a lot of agencies, what they'll do is they'll have, uh, you can do a ride along with their crime scene. Um, that way you can kind of get a feel for a day to day, the uh, a view behind the the show CSI. So you get to kind of a feel of what are truly what a truly day shift is on forensics or crime scene rather. So I would I would encourage in that. Um, like I said before, there's a lot of um, with forensics, there's a lot of biology and chemistry related parts to it. So if you don't like biology and chemistry, you might want to <laughs> rethink it. That's good advice. Um, we've got some kids from a civics class in here. Uh, can you speak to the balance between uh, law enforcement, collection of specimens, and, and the rights of uh, folks? Uh, and you have things uh, thrown out because of civil rights. Um, I'm trying to think of this, let's see. All right. You do have a lot of aspects where it's um, some of our older cases where they didn't have DNA. Like DNA is, it, it's, it doesn't care who's, who's right or wrong. It just it gives you the facts. It's kind of like the old saying, just a facts, man. That's one of the good things about forensics is if you got DNA. It's not going to try persuading the case in any way. It's just going to tell you what you got. Um, you have had it's instances in the past where you've some old cases where the, the basically it was there was no DNA or forensics involved it was more or less just a um, well we know this this guy's history so so you're having a lot of that stuff come up now and especially with DNA once DNA comes into the mix they'll have actually have a lot of cases turn like I think we had one um, I want to say maybe four or five years ago where it was a guy that was charged with a, I want to say as a sexual assault, but they actually, they didn't have his DNA and then they actually took it now that um, we actually have a way of testing a small sample of DNA and was actually able to show that he wasn't the one involved. So, I mean, you're seeing a lot more of that come about because up until about the middle of, the 90s, DNA, you actually had to have a lot of DNA in order to process the, a sample. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, I mean, you can have the smallest bit, bit of DNA or like you have skin cells or a small little piece of blood and you can get a DNA off of it. Interesting. And as far as, uh, let's see here, as far as collecting specimens, um, that is a lot of it's voluntary. I mean, it's, it's not one of those things unless you've got a warrant, we can't just go around collecting everybody's DNA. Uh, that's, that's one of the biggest things that helps us out is DNA. I mean, it sounds like one of those things, invasion of privacy, but in the same sense though, if you didn't do it, you're not gonna be uh, hesitant to give DNA. You know, it's not gonna, you have nothing to do with, it, which is, Kind of one of the things that helps us out because I've had a lot of instances where, like, I, I guess a good example would be um, fingerprints. If I get fingerprints from a scene, typically what I'll try to do, if, like I said, if it's a car break in, I'll try to get what's called elimination prints from the victim. That way, so if I, those prints, I don't enter those into our, our specs machine, but I'll actually do a manual comparison just to see if my prints are actually from the victim. That way, I'm not like, spinning my wheels wondering, okay, when these plants, these, I've got these fingerprints, but they haven't come back to somebody. 
Hey, we've got a bunch of questions here, um, but the one that's really kind of relevant to what you just said, is there a time when DNA is ever wrong? I haven't seen the sense of DNA. DNA, like I said, DNA is not one of those. It's, it's trying to um, favor one side. It, just, it tells you, tells you science. Um, I can think of some cases where somebody's tried to tamper with DNA in that sense, it's never, the DNA is never really lied. It's just the uh, person has found a way to try to get past it. Like, um, uh, like there's a good show. If you like forensics, a good show to watch is Forensic Files. That's kind of one of my favorite ones. And I can think of one case in particular where they had a, is up in Canada. They had a, a doctor who was basically molesting his patients and they had, they was trying to do it. They did a DNA sample and with him, they actually wanted to draw blood from him to get a, a voluntary sample. He submitted to it, but what he was doing was he was actually taking patient's blood, putting it in a rubber tube, a little syringe tube or a tube and uh, medically inserting into his arm. So they would basically inject the blood from that tube and not his actual blood. And, and whenever they'd get it tested, it wouldn't come back to the, it wouldn't match the uh, suspect's DNA because he was actually using somebody else's DNA, not his cell, or somebody else's blood, not his cell, which is actually a very unique thing to happen. I mean, that's not something that always happens, but it's it's out there. That's becoming, uh, unfortunately, more and more common, people taking advantage of other people like that, or at least right. more well-known. And that's, that's kind of one of the things, like I know I mentioned earlier about the glove, that's that's what we've got now is you do have a, um, <clears throat> you have a lot of people trying to, I guess, beat the system like with fingerprints, you wear gloves, you don't have to worry about it. Um, DNA is a little bit more trickier because if you put uh, anything, like say you put a, a mask on, if you lose that mask, then that's got DNA in it. So it's kind of like the blood one. That's, there's a, you can try to beat it, but it's, it, DNA's, DNA will find you out. Um, we're going to get all these questions, but one of the comments was uh, the, uh, one of the folks watching has a sister that works as a DNA analyst and had a case where a ball cap was left at a scene and they arrested the guy based on the cap, but his friend had actually borrowed the cap to commit the crime. So that was kind of interesting. Well, and that's, um, that's one of the things like we've got is, um, with our uh, DNA, we actually send that off. We don't do it in-house. And one of the things with DNA is like, for example, if you touch a door handle, you're gonna leave your DNA on there, but you've also got to keep in mind that that's a door handle, that's a common area. So when they go to test it, whoever's got the most DNA on that door handle, it's probably gonna, it's gonna have a mixed sample and you will be able to determine, okay, there's multiple suspects here or subjects here, but, you won't be able to say, like, for example, the ball cap, I'm sure you'll have the suspect's hair and the friend that they had borrowed the cap from's hair. It, it's kind of one of those things where once you get to that point where you got two DNA samples, it's like, okay, well, we got this one and that one. Then it's just kind of, that's when you go to the detective part of it. You got to say, well, we got the cap from you and you're saying your friend borrowed it. So then this is kind of, you do the uh, interview section of it. So it's, it's kind of one of those things where it's, it's not the slam dunk when you get the DNA. It gives you a good road to travel down to find the result. Gotcha. So we got, um, one of our questions was, um, it's a two-parter. How do you investigate if someone was shot in a car and then you have, and how do you deal with bank robbery? I know we've had several bank robberies here in Lexington as well. So I'm sure you have some insight on that. A lot of times, well, with uh, with someone shot in a car, um, one of the things with gunshots is it uh, emits what we call a gunshot residue. So if they were shot in a car, that car is going to be filled with filled with gunshot residue. We actually have a way of testing for that. Um, you can actually test with somebody if you've shot a gun. We can swab and we we'll actually can determine whether or not you have shot a gun or not. Um, and also with that, it's uh let's see 
one things with a, a gunshot is it also you, you what we do is a gunshot orientation where we'll basically find where that gunshot came from. Um, like if it's if it traveled from out of the car inside, a lot of times if it hit like a window or something, you're gonna have a lot of glass inside there, and the, the striations on the glass where it struck it will actually tell you as well. Um, as far as bank robberies, a lot of times with that, they they actually have a I'm trying to think of what it is. There's a they they're able to track the serial numbers off the dollar bills that they give them. So, I mean, it's it's not like the uh, the good old days of, what's his name, the Bonnie and Clyde where they go to the bank, rob it, and run off. A lot of times, bank robberies are one of those things when the, when that comes out, you, uh, it's it's almost like the, the cavalry's call. I mean, it's you've got everybody come, not just, like, say, if a bank is robbing Lexington, you're not going to have just Lexington Police Department responding you'll probably have the county highway patrol because they're all listening on the radio when they hear something like that it's kind of like everybody's looking for it. they're giving out descriptions and everything um, let's see oh we got another one if a gun releases its bullet cast what do you do with the cast um so you mean the gun case, the casings? Bullet case. Um, uh, with the bullet casings, we actually do enter those into a system which is called NIBIN. That's National Ballistics. I'm trying to think what it is. Um, but what it, the simple term for it is, we'll take those shell casings and we can actually put them, it takes a picture of them. When a, a shell casing is ejected from a gun, what it does is it puts these markings on it, and that's very unique to that firearm. So, say we have a shooting uh, at one at one date, then six down, months down the road, there's a shooting in like another city. They will actually they can enter theirs in the night, but, and if they if their shooting involves the same gun as ours, it will actually pop a hit, kind of like a fingerprint hit. And at that point, we can kind of see, okay. Do you have any suspects? If they're, um, we can kind of go from there. Um, kind of with them, like I said, with most things, it's not that well. If we've got a gunshot or a shooting here and they've got a shooting there, whoever they've arrested is a person, we, it's not going to give us that slam dunk like that, but it will give us a an area to investigate. So, I mean, that's actually uh, like for a good example is we, uh, I want to say maybe two or three years ago, we actually had a instance where uh, there was a shooting in High Point and the next day we actually stopped a suspect with that, a gun that was involved in that shooting. So what we'll do then with that is like if we seize a gun off somebody, we'll actually do what we do is call it a test fire. We'll um, fire two casings and collect those spent casings and submit them to Niven and that's kind of like our known. So when we did that, it actually came back to their case. And on something like that, that that's pretty unusual to find it that close of a time frame, which tells me that if this gun was used last night and this suspect has it, odds are they're probably the one who was involved. If not, they know who's involved. So we kind of, it definitely helps us as far as that goes. That was a good one though. That's pretty cool. I didn't. I did not realize the casing could tell you so much. Oh yeah, I mean it's. I mean, um, a lot of firearm manufacturers actually the firing pin, like for example, a Glock, is very unique. Um, so without even entering the dive, and a lot of times we can determine, we can get an idea. I guess would be a better option to say is what what fired that casing. But then from there we can actually see like the the grooves and scrape marks that the gun actually produces onto the casing. So I'm sort of wondering, so like residue wise, um, like when you test a test, like in a car for residue and stuff like that. And uh -huh. um, now does the, is the residue different? Like, let's say 
I fire a gun and then I'm with some other people that fired a gun and you're testing us for residue. Can you determine who might have murdered somebody when everybody has residue on them? That's one of the downsides to gunshot residue. It's it's all kind of the same thing. If you've got gunshot residue, you've got gunshot residue. It's it's uh, basically we'll, a lot of times we use it to determine whether or not somebody's fired a gun. If we've got multiple suspects on something like that, you uh, we can do GSR on it. The uh, only downside is all it's going to tell. I mean, if they're all in the same room and one gun was shot, they're all going to have it. That's the that's the one drawback to gunshot residue it's unfortunately it's getting to the point where that one's not as big a thing as it used to be just because you're having um more instances where you've got a lot of people just in one room and gunshot uh, that gunshot residue can actually travel about 10 to 15 feet from that gun so say that's another uh good thing about um uh, gunshot uh, orientation. If I've got a, a victim and I can kind of determine how close they were shot based off of the stippling and gunshot residue. So if there's like a lot of gunshot residue on almost like burning on their skin, that says that gun, uh, gun was within 10 feet of them. So it gives us a little bit of it, but like I said, GSRs are kind of getting to the point where it's it, it helps but it's not as a big of a slam dunk as it used to be gotcha um we've got another question here um this one's from a movie zodiac um so uh, apparently in the movie there was somebody that a suspect tested for dna and he really was the killer but nothing matched up um but the cops let him go uh, because the DNA didn't match, um, but you know he's guilty. Like, what do you do next? Well, that's, unfortunately, that's one of the biggest things we face is you have a lot of people like that. If they're if they're not in the system, there's not a lot we can do with that. Um, a, a good example of that would be um, the Oklahoma City bombing. I'm sure there may not be a lot of students that know too much about that one, but the uh, Timothy McVeigh, Actually, when he did that, right after he uh, bombed that federal building, he was stopped by an officer, I want to say, maybe an hour or two later. And he was stopped because he had a uh, fictitious tag on his car. Um, the officer arrested him because he had a firearm concealed and didn't, didn't have a concealed carry. He was actually probably, let's see, I want to say it's like 30 minutes from being released before they realized, oh, this is the guy that bombed Oklahoma City. So that's when they kind of stopped. But I mean, that's that's a good example of how if you don't have, if they've never done anything or never actually done anything with it, submit DNA or fingerprints, their their information will not be on file. Gotcha. So I, I guess a good example would be if you've got somebody that's, uh, I think they new to the country, say you've got somebody from Mexico that comes to the United States, never been in the system in any way, they go and rob a bank, they can put a perfectly good handprint on the door, and unfortunately, if they've never been in the system, we can collect that fingerprint and it won't come back to them. That's one of our biggest issues is when we have somebody that's not in the system like that. It'll help you out once you finally catch them, but to catch yeah. them, it's not going to be any worth anything. But the good thing about that is, is what I've seen trends is it's like once once somebody does something once, they'll do it again. It's never a one and done type thing. So it's it's just a matter of time. It's just a, a time wait for them to find, get that one time where we actually catch them. Gotcha. Um, I have a question. Go ahead with your question. What type of weapons do y'all use? Well, like our uh, duty weapon. Yes. We uh, we carry the the Glock 22, which is the I'm sorry, the uh, the Glock 17, which is the nine millimeter. 
Okay. I'm, I know somebody with one of those. It's, uh, uh, it's a pretty good one. Yeah. Do you drive a regular patrol car? I'm just curious. I actually have a uh, prime van. It's um, it's actually set up a little bit different than our typical patrol cars, because uh, mainly most of the time, like I said, what I'm for is I'll actually be doing the processing the crime scenes versus um, doing the typical patrol work. So my van, or my crime van, needs to have things such as evidence bags. Um, the chemicals to process crime scenes, fingerprint kit, a camera, a lot of things like that. You got all the toys. Oh yeah, I got all the all the fun stuff. Yeah. Um, let's see. I got a question here. I'm not sure I understand it. What if there were two involved in a crime, but one committed the crime? What would you do with the other one? So I guess you got two people there, and you're not sure. Who, Maybe who it is, I guess. Um, a lot of times like that, if we got two involved, I mean, you could, if, say you, you're, um, I, I guess a good example, if you're with a friend and they're, uh, they rob somebody and you, you drive off and see that, you can actually be charged with aiding and abetting. So, I mean, it, it's a sense, if you're, uh, if you're around them when they're doing it and you're helping them out, you can be charged just as well. Okay. Somebody wants to know about retirement. Um, is there a certain amount of years you have to put in when you, so you can retire? All right. Well, with retirement, typically law enforcement, it's 30 years. So after about 30 years, you can retire. Most people, when their 30 years comes up, they go and retire. A lot, a lot of officers actually get into it, the field of law enforcement, about in their early 20s. So by the time they're pushing 55, they, they're looking to get out and enjoy life. That's, that's one thing with law enforcement. It is a very um, grueling drop job. It's, it's a tough one on you, especially on your families. So with that, it, it, that's why a lot of officers, once their 30 years comes up, they're ready to retire. But like I said, but while we're doing it, we enjoy it. So we got another question. Um, do you carry the body bags in your van? Actually, um, anything like that, we have a um, EMS. They'll actually handle anything as far as like if we got a body. Um, I know a lot of bigger agencies such as like out west, like LA, they have a coroner that's part of the police department that actually handles that. We actually we do our investigative and process the crime scene part of it, but once we're done with that, we'll have uh, EMS and they'll have their medical examiner come out there. They'll actually do, a, in a sense, investigation of their own, and they'll they'll be the one that transports the body. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Revis wants to know who really was DB Cooper. <laughs> I've talked to the FBI about that. One. <laughs> that's above my pay grade <laughs> oh man <laughs> thanks Mr. Ravis anybody else have any questions this has been really interesting I appreciate you doing this for us not a problem not a problem so, so basically um, I know we had some kids coming in and come, going out and coming back in um, probably lost signal, but um, if they want to be a forensic, uh, go into forensics, they, there's two different ways you can do it. You can go to school for forensics, basically, and then you can either go into law enforcement or you can go into law enforcement on the civilian end. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. All right. So their, their next step is to make sure they get good grades in school and go to a college that has forensics, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Gotcha. All right, does anybody else have any questions so we can let Detective Forrest get back to saving Lexington? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, Joseph wants to know, how old do you have to be uh, to be in law enforcement? Um, it's actually interesting. You can be 
like in North Carolina, you actually have you have to take what's called basic law enforcement training before you can be, become a police officer. Um, you can start that at 20, but you can't actually be sworn to your 21. And one of the reasons for that is you're carrying a firearm, so they won't they're not going to issue you a firearm without being 21. So I would say 21 to do law enforcement, but you can start as early as 20 to actually take the training. Okay. Um, so it would be good to go ahead and get that four-year degree in forensics and then go to uh, law. That would, um, that would be my suggestion is start taking science and biology classes, getting a good feel for it, and run with it. Gotcha. Um, I think I know the answer to this one. Uh, Victor wants to know if there's uh, charges, uh, what charges a person receives for shooting a, uh, an officer. It's that one was actually very serious. A lot of times, like we actually had a instance very recently where off, there was a shooting involving an officer. Nobody was hit, thankfully, but um, a lot of times we have instances where it's an officer involved shooting. Well, actually, uh, those kind of get priority. Um, it's still a uh, uh, charge as anybody else. If you shoot somebody else, you're going to get, I mean, it's going to be the same charge. However, if you're shooting a, an officer, the problem is it's kind of like a, um, I guess the best way to put it is like if you see a, a bee's nest, if you mess with one of the bees, you're going to get the whole hive coming after you. So they'll, I can tell you right now, if you get a, if, somebody shoots an officer, the, the whole department's probably going to be doing what they can to get that person charged for. Good question. Um, I'm not, I don't know if I understand this question. Do you need permission to solve a certain case? Um, no, typically what we, uh, what goes on here is we'll actually be assigned cases. Um, so like during the day or during the, regular week i'll actually be assigned cases as they come in like the patrol officers take the first report and then after that it kind of goes through the chain of command and then they disperse them to the uh detectives so from that point then we kind of are assigned cases we don't necessarily have any particular ones where it's like just a case and we want to take it and anything like that i mean it's there's no like asking for permission for a case gotcha Okay, that, that's cool. That makes sense. Uh, okay, so we uh, we got another question. Um, well, I think I know the answer to this one. I think this is a definite yes. Um, this student's heard that uh, most officers, detectives develop a brotherhood. Is that true? Oh, yes. Um, law enforcement, it's probably the closest you can get to military. It's, it's almost like a, um, if you're on a sports team you kind of know when you're who you're working with kind of where they are and you can almost kind of read their character and it's it's one of those things where you have i mean it's it's almost a unanimous thing with anybody in law enforcement like i can go somewhere to another state and i see somebody in law enforcement is there's something about that you just have like this connection with them so i mean it's it just clicks but yeah they're definitely as a brother very good um, we've got a cold case question. Um, I'm assuming they mean how long do you keep cold case cold cases on file? We actually have cold cases back from, I'll say the oldest one we got now is from the 70s or 80s. Um, typically, we'll keep cold cases till it gets solved. Um, we've actually got one now where it's like with our cold cases, all the ones we've got, they usually assign one or two of them to a detective where they've got that cold case. Now, with the cold case, it's not one of those that's going to be constantly checked on every day because it's most cases after about six months, it's almost kind of like goes into slow mode where it's you're still working on it, but you're not working on it like you were a report where somebody's car got broken to last week. This one, most of those are it's like a missing person or something like that aspect. So you basically, if you get a lead, you'll run with it. You'll run that till it gets exhausted. And then you just kind of 
put it on pause until you can get anything else from it. So, I mean, they're, they're slow going once you get to them, but once you, you get a lead, you kind of run with it just since it's, you've got something. So they never really close. They just, they're, yeah, they're, they're usually, they're open until that we get it solved. Gotcha. Good job. Good questions. All right. Anybody else? That's a lot of information right there, folks. <laughs> and uh, let me ask about um, ride-alongs. So do you, does Lexington Police Department do the ride-alongs? I know we did. I know now with the coronavirus, it's kind of, of course, it's changed everybody around. So I'm not certain how we go now. I know at one point we did have ride-alongs. We actually had um, actually had a lot of uh, high school students that would do a uh, what they called an internship, where they would spend like maybe a week or a couple of days, and they would uh, ride along with our crime scene investigators. I had one with you, I believe. Can't. I think you did. Yeah. So we do that. We do have that aspect. I know it's it's kind of on limbo now with the the social distancing thing, but we do have. There is programs like that out there. I know, I think other agencies have them as well, but that's that's definitely a good thing to look into if you're wanting to pursue this field, because that will give you a truly a real-time feel of how it's gonna be. Yeah, that's what, uh, hopefully things will return to normal sometime soon. Um, we've gotten one more question, but I think it's more for a patrol officer. Um, it's talking about stopping a car and suspect, suspecting um, drugs in the car. Um, you probably, well, I can tell you if, if they're, if they got drugs, they'll probably get charged for it. Uh, yep, exactly. And they, and if you have to get the dog, you have to get the dog. You just do whatever you have to do. Won't you? Exactly. We do have uh, several canines, so that's not an issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've seen them on the side of the road many days, many days. Oh yes. <laughs> the best uh, best way to avoid that is to just avoid uh, having drugs in your car. Exactly. Or exactly. on your person at <laughs> at all. So, all right. Well, officer, uh, Detective Forrest, and we don't call you officer; we call you detective. Correct. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yep. Well, Detective Forrest, we really, really appreciate you taking your time with us today. You've gotten a lot of thank yous here. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, we we do appreciate it. We uh, we probably have you back sometime. Well, that sounds great. I'd I love to be back. All right. We all stay safe over there. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. Um, Bye. Thank you for your service. Yep. Thank you. Oh, thank you.